Hi, guys. Welcome back to Steps to Sobriety. Yes, you heard right. <laughs> Into the light, a different life story. That was the typical introduction of all my beautiful interviews with my fantastic guests here. But uh, it is, we started off originally a year and a bit ago as Steps to Sobriety. Then we changed because I thought, yeah, let's, let's be more true to, to what we do. We give hope. We bring people out of their darkness and, and show them the light. And that is that is how I saw myself and still do see myself. Problem is, it is such a vague title that people just don't find us. So since we want to spread the word, since we want to, to have these beautiful interviews reach more people out there, so we're changing the word back to, or the name back, to Steps to Sobriety. So welcome back. You have gone full circle with me here. So and we are here to do exactly the same. Look at the reasons why people live their life in sometimes the sad way they do and why they try to escape reality uh, with anything that goes, let that be alcohol, drugs, sex, uh, prescription medications, food, all those kind of things. How about we address the underlying problems? And that will not change. I promise you that I swear that on my heart. And today is no exception because I've got Lawrence Lotz with me. Lawrence is the wolf of Queen Street. And uh, that's that's an interesting title. And, uh, the Wolf of Wall Street, we know, mm -hmm. film with Michael Douglas, maybe not such a nice guy. I beg to differ here. Uh, Lauren seems to be actually quite a nice guy. And I thought I'd bring him on. And we explore about his story and his transformation. But also today is, is an interview where we go into wealth and wealth matters. And follow me through even if you have got belief systems where you think oh, money money doesn't make you happy or all these kind of things that sometimes we get brought up with just bear with me okay just listen to lawrence listen to me and we'll see maybe at the end of the the interview you might find yourself wondering hmm is are there not simple steps that i can take to actually make my life a little bit nicer, and then maybe I can do the nice things that I want to do to others a bit easier when you actually have your own wealth. So, Lawrence, thank you so much for coming on to my show. Dead excited to have you on. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Thanks so much for the introduction. And uh, it's always it's always great being on the other side of the table as uh, obviously fellow podcast and myself, and as you said, uh, the Wolf of uh, Queen Street. Yeah. Yes, uh, a bit of a knockoff to anyone from the Wolf of Wall Street, but it's uh, a bit of my journey and story behind of why I picked that name as well. Which is brilliant because, you know, there is... We all are full of full of story and history, uh, mm -hmm. so to speak. So and, um, why don't we go back in time? Let's do a little time warp and go back when you were a youngster. Um, did you tell one day to your mommy, mommy, I know it. I'm going to be the, uh, the wolf of Queen Street. Not the Queen of Wall Street. <laughs> um, um, no, funny enough is I grew up wanting to be a lawyer. So yes, I wanted to grow up and be something that was talking a lot and thought they knew everything and told other people what to do. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, for many, many years, I wanted to, uh, to do that and went into varsity to start law. And as with most people, but again, the, uh, the emphasis on what I want to be a lawyer is I grew up seeing lawyers on TV and seeing them in the limelight and seeing them standing there and having all this power and controlling and everything else. And, you know, that's where, that's what I, to me was like, I want that. I want that sign and symbol of success. Uh, growing up in South Africa, you know, you looked outward. You never, unfortunately, uh, the way the country's gone, you couldn't look inwards inside uh, of South Africa for a lot of motivation. You had to look outwards. So I grew up going, that's where I wanted to be. And as I got uh, into Varsity and started, I started realizing, well, it's not exactly down. And my path changed subtly. Um, and I actually went into psychology. And I got a psychology degree, again, which might help with a bit of the discussions and talking to people. And followed that path and then went into the corporate world uh, for the last oh, 15 years in the corporate world doing sort of my day job. But a handful of years ago, I had friends come up to me, um, Stefan, and said, Lawrence, you've always had this knack of being able to ha handle conversations. 
So to anyone at the moment, myself and Stefan had to actually stop talking off air because we'd been really talking, I think it's about an hour before we even started <laughs> recording the show because we're like, if we don't stop and start the show, we'd never get the podcast. So that's the sort of thing I always had the snack, right? So I always handle these conversations every hour. And, and friends said to me, you should look into podcasting. We should look into doing sort of a show or a talk show. And this was almost three years going three three years ago or further back. And I was like, cool, I still want that edge. I still want that light in there. So big fan of the Wolf of Wall Street, big fan of that whole, that success, that money, that everything it entails at that stage of my life. Let me just say that stage of my life. Mm-hmm. So I thought, okay, I live in Auckland, New Zealand now. Our main street is called Queen Street. So why don't I become the Wolf of Queen Street? <laughs> Started that brand. I, my original branding was me in a white suit standing like this with a photo of Auckland behind it in the same <laughs> coloring as the Wolf of the Wall of Wall Street. I mean, I, I was just craving to to be that character and to have all of that stuff. And and the podcast launched and and the, the direction I took was the same thing. I wanted to talk to the best in the business. I wanted to talk to the most important people, the most successful CEOs and everything else that were entailed success and money and all that everything else. And don't get me wrong, all the guests that on my show were absolutely amazing and inspiring. But when I started, that's where I wanted. I, I wanted just to feed and get all, all, all of those things. But the life life changes, uh, Stefan, and life sometimes, <laughs> you know, brings in an alter or a change, you know, and there was a bit of a change for me at that moment. <laughs> no shit, Sherlock. But we, <laughs> we're going to come to that. We're going to come to that. Going back to South Africa, was your mm-hmm. family wealthy or were you rather coming from sort of blue color background? I, w- I wouldn't say we were rich, but my parents were well off. Uh, my parents, you know, worked worked hard their whole life as everyone else did. And um, we, yeah, we had, we had opportunities that some other kids might not have had, but we weren't sitting there at the top level and so forth. So we were still shown and brought up with um, character and integrity and hard work. Nice. Uh, one of the biggest one of the uh, biggest things, mottos my dad ever installed into me, and it was sort of very simply, it was, you know, the Ever Ready battery. You get a brand mm-hmm. called Ever Ready. Mm-hmm. And he's and that's existed for I don't know how many years, so, you know, even before I was a kid. And he said to me, you've always got to be an Ever Ready battery. And to a kid, I was like, what do you mean I've got to be a battery? And he goes, you've always got to be ready for any situation that life brings you. So if you want to be successful in sport as a 16-year-old or you want to take this career or you want to take this opportunity, especially when you're young, 16, 18, 20, 22, you know, in the early 20s, you've got to be ready for that situation at that moment. And it was one of the biggest things that I lived most of my life was I was always over ready for something if it came along. So people are like, oh, Lawrence, what are you preparing for? Oh, I'm preparing for this, to, you know, if this opportunity comes or if someone knocks on my door for this and like, that's not going to happen. But to me, if it happened in the path I wanted to see, I made sure I was ready for it. I'm trying to find what drove you. I'm trying to find the motivator that you had there. Living in South Africa um, mm-hmm. over the last 25 years, things uh, were very tumultuous. And so was there from the word go also a disaster preparedness in your own family? Was it normal to have um, enough water, enough food, enough all of these things at home and always have a, a plan B, C, D if plan A fails? Was that normal? Was that brought was it a normal part of upbringing for you? For me, yes. I um, I was a kid. Um, I remember when they freed Nelson Mandela, when they went to the 94 general elections. I remember vividly my parents stocking up every pantry that we had with food and water <laughs> um, so that we had six months of supply because we didn't know what was going to happen after the elections and so forth. Um, so that that a lot of that was standard to me as my upbringing i look back now i think that's not normal a kitchen go through a lot of those stuff we went through um but you, you spoke about stefan um mm-hmm. where's the where's the drive or the urge a big thing and a lot of people if you're in new zealand and listening to this at the moment on standard and why south africans sometimes come across very arrogant or blunt or in your face is we live in a country or when i would grow up is where if you've got an opportunity you've got to take it or someone else will and mm. I sometimes say to people and they don't understand it, it's like, 
you've actually got to fight to survive. Um, in New Zealand, you know, we live in one of the most beautiful, the, we live now in the most beautiful countries, safest countries in the world. You don't understand a nation of, if I don't have to, if I don't fight to get ahead or fight, and I'm not talking about physical, I mean, working hard and, and grinding and doing the most to be able to actually do something, I might not have food on the table. I might not have that opportunity and so forth. Um, and that's sometimes what people see I mean, South Africans, because we've come in that whole culture, especially when we're coming to New Zealand. I mean, there's so many of us around you. People go, you're a little bit in the face. You're a little bit um, overpowering. And it's because in South Africa, <laughs> everything is 100 miles an hour. Yeah. And everything is, you've got to make decisions now. You've got to make life decisions. You've got to, you know, you brought up with the violence and the issues and the, um, the corruptness and all that stuff. And that's that's... <laughs> you can't really say that Germany is anywhere close to South Africa. Having said that, due to my upbringing and the circumstances of my youth, I had actually very similar lessons. Uh, regrettably, there was violence, gang violence that I was a recipient of. And I certainly, they, my parents were not well off by any stretch of imagination. Mm -hmm. So there was not necessarily always food there. And certainly when I look back at my mother, who was born basically in the, in the dying days of the Second World War, mm -hmm. and go back to my grandmother uh, and great-grandmother, which have lived for First World War, etc., all these lessons were handed down. Um, yet at the same token, there, there was always this, this fear, the anxiety there, the knowledge that you need to prepare. Yet when I actually look back, and in practical terms, I was never taught to be prepared. And that is bizarre when I actually think about it. Yeah. Nowadays, I have seen the light, so to speak. And certainly since being in this beautiful country in New Zealand, where I've put my roots down, now I can also look at plan B, C, D, and mm -hmm. say, well, what actually happens if we are living on the Pacific Rim of Fire? which we do, yeah. um, you don't need crazy governments. You just yep. need a crazy earthquake. And thank you very much. There are no more pharmacies. So have you got enough medications of whatever you need for three, six months, et cetera? How do you deal with an economic uh, down, uh, breakdown, such as mm -hmm. maybe with COVID, as we have seen? So suddenly, just bizarre, 10 years ago, I gave lectures in my hospital about disaster preparedness. And people laughed at me and video here. And then suddenly there were a Christchurch earthquake and things yeah. like that. And suddenly people said, Yeah, what are you doing? I mean, how do you do that? And, so, and suddenly there was this, yeah, hmm. And now with COVID, we see it again and again. But it seems to be that the memory of people is about yay. They can yeah. just about remember that. Whilst you and I have got a deeper drive. And I think that is that is where I wanted to to look at. So here you were, you were you were born hungry, you were brought up hungry, and you were brought up to look for opportunities. And when they materialize, you make a, a decision um, to either go with it or not. Yeah. What skill sets did you learn to actually make these decisions? So someone comes to you and says, hey, I've got a great, great opportunity. Brilliant. You're going to make $10,000. You give me $10 and you make $10,000. Well, even I would I've not heard, take I've heard, I've heard that one before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, you know, did you, yeah. you, you sort of started law and psychology, but yeah. then you were focusing a bit more on the, on the financial side. How did you know what to do? You know, it's one of those biggest... Uh, a challenge is most people of us, most of us even uh, realize is what is, what do we do? And what do we want to do? And what, where, and where's our passion? And where does it sit in that spectrum of things? Right. And, you know, yes, I went to start, I want to go as become a lawyer. Then I went into psychology. I want to become a clinical psychologist. And then I pivoted into organizational psychology, which is psychology in the business side. Mm -hmm. And then I've ended up being in the corporate world as a project manager. And again, it's, I'm talking a lot and I'm telling people what to do. I, I see a bit of a, I see a bit of a trait going on there. Um, but I'm lucky enough that that is something that I'm passionate about that I've, I've, I've fell into, right? Just as my sort of what I call my day job. But along that spectrum, I've got the, the entrepreneurship bug, unfortunately, sort of that urge of always seeking more and wanting more. 
Um, so through my 20s, I'd always come up with ideas. Okay, I'm going to start this company. I'm going to start that company. I'm going to start this idea. Or people would come to me the same thing as well and go, Lawrence, what about this? What about that? So mm -hmm. I've had so many companies started over, so many companies closed, so many ideas. <laughs> you know, the you know my wife's so used to it. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do this, babes. And she's like, yep, cool. And she knows like three months later, I'm like, hey, babes, I'm going to try this. And she's like, yep, cool. Um, <laughs> because it's sort of like almost like a bug. Uh, and um, it's great for drive but it's you're literally driving down the road it's never going to have an end and if you stop this road and you go onto that road it's the same thing you're never um, going to get down there but you know but it's how do i handle to make certain situations when people come to me or myself is depending on where people come to me with i've learned enough law knowledge especially in the last couple of years and running my own podcast and having so many amazing people around me that I will look into something, either if, if I find it myself or someone brings it to me, if it is within or touches on my wheelhouse of knowledge. So if someone comes to me on the outside, so that means I'll just look into it. doesn't mean I'll jump on board or anything else. If someone comes onto me in the outside world and goes, hey, um, you know, imagine we go three years ago before anyone knew it. Hey, I've got this thing called Bitcoin. Do you want to jump on board? I would have gone, hold on. You know, this is not something in my wheelhouse. I've got no knowledge. I don't understand anything about it. Mm. Um, I don't see the logical behind it and I leave it alone. And I accept that. Yes, I might've missed an opportunity. Yes, something could have happened, but I also see the other side of the coin. No, I don't have the knowledge. No, I don't have the great enough understanding. So I could also make bad mistakes with it. But when people come with stuff to me or myself looking at stuff within my warehouse, I then take a look at it. I love my numbers. I love my further knowledge about a sort of an area. And that's where the conversation comes in. So I take a look at something. I keep re researching, keep researching, talking to people about it. And fundamentally, if I can find enough education about something that's legitimate, legitimate education now, not crap. And I can talk to someone about this legitimate idea with this underpinning education. They go, wow, that sounds good. Then I know I've got something. Because I can come to someone with a crappy idea that's got no education, that's all these quick rich schemes, and everyone goes, oh, it sounds amazing. How does that work? And you go, oh, it's just smoke and mirrors. That's not where I go for. But if I can do that same excitement expression with the right piece, then it allows me to make an easy decision. Indeed. And that's and exactly what you're saying there. You like your figures, so you like your facts. You actually ask questions. You don't just jump to conclusions. You don't go in there with your heart, but you actually crunch the numbers and say, well, yeah, that house looks really nice, but it's <laughs> nah, that will drain me dry more than a vampire can. No, thank you very much. Whilst that house doesn't look so good, but actually the numbers are really good. Thank you very much. We'll go for that house. Exactly. Yeah, right. totally. Look, yeah, I'm I'm a passionate guy. I always have been, but I've, I'm lucky enough. Some sometimes, in the things that I'm really really into, my passion sometimes gets a bit of ahead of my brains. Um, but in other areas where I need it, my brains comes yeah. in first before the passion. And it is like sometimes, uh, like we've had a situation, my wife, where we've got to make uh, decisions around investment options or ideas that impact our life. That you got to have the business decision, not the, the personal decision. And she'll go to me, Lawrence, you make it. Because to me, I would have gone this way, but I know that's a personal decision. That's not a clear line in the box, uh, correct business decision. Nice, nice. So is she more the, the kind of go for the heart and oh, I really love that. And oh, I feel this is a good idea versus you're saying, yeah, I really appreciate the, the return on investment on this. <laughs> so who is who in your relationship? <laughs> well, we, funny enough, we both do the same day job. We both contract project managers in the IT and the corporate world. Right. Yeah. We just got two different personalities, obviously. Uh, so uh, I'm blunt, I'm more pushy, yeah. uh, more get in there. She's more of a people person. So she's more of uh, um, understanding, working through um been a lot more gentle in situations. Um, a good few years ago, I got the nickname the sledgehammer in the corporate world because <laughs> I, would, I would go in and get stuff done and just smash walls down and in like, thank you, see you later. It works in certain, certain situations. It doesn't work in other situations. And unfortunately, that has caught me out. Mm. So we opposite side of... Uh, so, yes, sometimes we drive and go crazy because we still think fundamentally in the same way. 
but we do sort of reverse in the uh, one pushing and one pulling. Nice, nice, nice. <laughs> and that's absolutely cool. And and that is the power of communication. Uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, the, if you actually uh, can be in a partnership with uh, yeah. your partner and you actually are agreeing on the same principles that certain things are important and that's how we go about it that can be such a beautiful beautiful thing now i'm married now nearly uh to <laughs> i don't even want to say the number it is it is a spooky number it is a big number but it's a gorgeous number because I'm married to this this really wonderful woman. Now, when we married, we had completely different drivers. We were young, stupid, full of hormones. And yeah, we were stupid and emotionally immature. And that also applied to wealth and yeah. to any kind of financial decisions. So here we were, not particularly great with money, and we couldn't communicate. <laughs> you can't see where that goes. <laughs> so we had some very, very traumatic rows in the past. And I think that is the reality for so many couples out there. Um, that is, the uh, many people, they are still financially virgins. They have no clue what they are doing, and they are living way above their means. Um, and it suddenly something happens, and suddenly you have major, major friction. Mm -hmm. um, were you ever like that? And how did you deal with that? Or what would you, if, if you see a friend of yours who has got a really, really, is close to you, but you see that they are nearly killing themselves because they can't talk about money. What do you say to such people? Well, I mean, my, I personally went through that challenge. So I don't know if you want me to jump into what happened to me in 2019. We might as well get into it, right? Well, touche, touche, actually, <laughs> touche. So bottom line is, bottom line is, guys, okay, buckle up. Um, because here we've got all this go-getter, and now suddenly shit will hit the fan. Yeah, so let's go back to the beginning of part of 2019, which I, start, I said in the beginning of the show, this is when I started my brand, uh, the Wolf of Queen Street, the, the the big drive, everything, you know, wanting that that glitz and glam out there. I uh, started going two, three, four months in this brand and, and following that direction where life, as it does occasionally to most of us, quite a few of us, threw me a curveball. Um, and not just one, but quite a few at one moment. And what had, what had happened is I found myself in the beginning part of that year, after having quite an impressive year before traveling the world with my wife, doing experiences we had never done before, you know, and having all this sort of moments of, hey, we've made it, sort of the whole pat on the shoulder. We, we live in a great life and success. My kids are healthy and everything else. Started 2019 feeling a little bit off and going, oh, okay, it might just be that I'm not, I'm not last year was heavy and last year wasn't all great for my health. I'm getting a bit older. I'm getting, I'm in my thirties, I'm putting on a bit of weight. I could just be a little bit off there. Um, but something nagged at me and said, okay, let me, let me go down um, the path. Let me just go and check and go and check in the doctors. Now guys, hands up. We are absolutely horrendous at this. We do not go and ask for help. We definitely don't go to our doctors when something's wrong. So please, I'll put my hand up. I used to be like that till this moment. Um, please do not let something like this slide. Went to my doctors. Um, they did a bit of a checkup to me. And they said, Lawrence, there's, there's something There's something we've seen in your results that's just not all good there. First is something we've seen in your results that shouldn't exist in yourself and fundamentally shouldn't exist in males. And then you're like, okay. What's going on here? So they said, no, hold on, it's fine. We're going to send you for some couple of more tests. So this is about April 2019. We're going to go and send you for a specialist. Um, we're going to go and send you for an MRI scan because we think what we've seen is that there's quite a common case of where um, you get a very small growth in the back of your head and sort of medication can get rid of it. It's quite, a, I thought, they're like, this is quite common. I'm like, how is this common? Something on your brain. So we went a couple of weeks later to go and get my MRI scan. And what happened was the specialist said to me, um, okay, go for the MRI scan and I'll see you a week later. I'll, I'll, we'll see you a week later and everything else. So I said, great. Went into the MRI scan with my wife, went in, done it. And it was an hour or two hours later, my specialist called me and said, Lawrence, I don't want to see you in a week's time. I want to see you at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. Mm. Now, when you get a phone call like that, 
I just, I get goosebumps, right? I've just got goosebumps right now. Every time that I can think of that moment, when you get a phone call like that, you know, at that exact split second, my life is never going to be the same because that drastic requirement of myself at some place means that there's something different. So myself and my wife go to specialists the next morning, they bring up my MRI scan. They said, Lawrence, we have found something on your brain. Um, my wife giggles going, oh, he's got brains. But they were like, no, 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 we've actually found something. And what it had been was a golf ball size, so about that size, brain tumor that encased uh, my pituitary gland, back of uh, my optic nerve, and was uh, pretty close to my um, carotid artery at the back. So something pretty severe. And a specialist said to me, we've got to get this sorted. This isn't something you know, you can wait months and months about. And it was at that moment talking through where I had a first realization for me in my life of not knowing what I really going to be doing today, tomorrow, or if I'm even going to be around in six months time. So it was at that moment I had that whole hidden the worst time you could ever consider and think about in your life for me, for my life experience and my family was right at that moment. Mm -hmm. So because of how drastic and everything was, a handful of weeks later, 26 of June, 2019, on my birthday, I actually went in for brain surgery um, to remove the brain tumor. Obviously successfully, because I'm sitting here at the moment, on the day that I used to celebrate my birth, I actually celebrate now, I call it, I celebrate me being alive. Um, the, the surgery went successful, but it doesn't mean I'm healthy or I've recovered and everything else after that moment uh, because they had to remove my pituitary gland, they had to do a whole lot of other stuff. And this was part of all the learnings after sort of June. And Stefan, you just spoken earlier about how do I how do I manage and see situations when I don't see eye to eye, for example, with my wife or I see with other friends and stuff. So during these couple of months, I'm sitting at home from brain surgery recovering. And up until that moment, we were what we called successful. We had our own home, family, our kids go to school. We own a couple of investment properties, our own shares. I do a few of the things. You know, I think everything is going great. A month goes past, I'm recovering. Two months go past, three months, as expected as part of the recovery. And I'm like, okay, it's fine. There's no issues. I've got insurance. I've paid my insurance for 10 years. Um, they will, they will, they will cover me. They, they will cover, they will cover, you know, me not working and everything else. I'm self-employed, so I've got no income coming in. And about three, three and a half months into it, I finally go and talk to the insurance company, uh, or we start going down the path. They said to me, go, Lawrence you've got insurance. And I go, yeah, I know I've paid for like the last 10 years. They go, yeah, there's, you got covered. And I'm like, I know that. And they go, but not for what you have. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm like, my insurance covers it. And they've sent me an email and I've got it. I've got, I've got it as a photo. And there was two lines in my condition that showed why they wouldn't pay me out. Firstly, A, um, what happens is, in New Zealand, we are so forward in our medical world, we are doing things the rest of the world are not doing. Brain surgery is one of those. In insurance policies, a couple of years ago, the brain surgery like I had, the expectation was to go through the skull. But in New Zealand, we are so mm. forward is we could go up the nose. Mm. So my insurance said to me, you had to go through the skull for this to play, pay out. And also the second reason why, I know that's crazy, right? <laughs> and the second reason why they wouldn't pay out was they said to me, you've got no long-term conditions. And I said to them, and I went back, and I actually got my specialist right away, and I said, hold on, I'm on medication for the rest of my life. Mm. If I get into, because I don't have a pituitary gland, I can't control my hormones. I go up and down like a yo-yo on some days. There's days I can't get out of the bed. There's days I don't even know what's going on. Mm. If I get into motor, if I get into a car accident, or if I even get sick, like I, a couple of weeks ago, I, just, I got a sinus infection. No, it wasn't. COVID, but I got a sinus infection. I've got to take a whole lot of extra medication just to give my body a, a chance. And they turned around and said, no, that doesn't count. You don't have no long-term because I look like a healthy human being. So close the case. There was, you know, four months, five months down the path. So this is now getting to the end of the year and I'm running out of money. 
I'm having to sell all the luxuries that I had, my invest, a lot of my investments, wow. my shares, everything out of there. And it finally came to January 2020, where um, I ended up being a hundred thousand dollars in the hole. So I, had, I was a hundred grand down, and nowhere to go from that. February 2020, I bounced on a mortgage. At that moment, as one of the three darkest moments was a part of it was I couldn't see how I was going to pay the bills or make my bills the next month. But not only was that happening, due to my condition and due to my hormones, myself and my wife no longer could see eye to eye. I was reacting in different ways to the man that she'd been married for for 15 years. My hot-headedness all of a sudden was instant. I would just go and I would go for 100 miles an hour of absolutely nothing. That it came to in February 2020, when I bounced on the mortgage, I was 100 grand in a hole. Me and my wife had to come out publicly to the world and go, we don't think we can make our marriage work anymore. We don't think we can stay together because we are not the same people that fell in love or got married 15 years earlier. And at that exact moment, the darkest, darkest point in my life, right? I, I had nothing. I didn't, my family was unstable. My creation, my wealth, my success that I thought that was so important was non-existent. Everything to me, you know, was just not there. It was literally pitch dark, head in the bottom and, you know, where to go from there. But one of the biggest things that I learned from that moment was that in the darkest, darkest moment of your life, if you're willing to look, you'll always see a faint light. You'll always see something small that you might see is nothing or it might see a little glimmer there, that if you pay attention to it and you take that step towards it, you can slowly start bringing things back into control. And that's what I had to do and my family had to do from going through 2020 into the end. Part of it was taking those initial steps and pulling back and realizing that, hold on, the what I thought was successful and the wealth and everything else that I was chasing is no longer important. What is actually important is family, health, and being able to help other people out as going to this moment, because it was in those moments where I needed those people that were helping me through mm -hmm. and slowly start building up and figuring out ways of how to pay my bills the next month and how to then take opportunities a few months later and how to slowly bring things back to get to me to a better situation actually than where I was before it from a financial and what we call old school wealth uh, point of view. But my perception of the wealth was totally different or my understanding of it that I didn't care about that limelight and the white suit and the, don't worry, I still wear the white suit, but I didn't care about that success on top of the pillar somewhere. I care about being stable and being able to give that pillar to someone else now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so it's, that's, uh, you know, a bit of the story. Please, and what a story it is. <sighs> Nothing prepared you there. Here you were a, a man who were, were a self-made man, uh, a go-getter, a uh, type A personality, going out there, outspoken, yay. Yep. And whilst you were the sledgehammer in the corporate world, uh, that suited you well. How did you deal with the with the fact that you suddenly had to get off the hamster wheel, that you were no longer in you in control of what was happening? It it was uh, that was basically in the immediate aftermath of surgery. So you knew they got it out, yep. but still things were to change for quite a while leave alone the wealth just mm -hmm. a lot of other things would change and you knew that then um how did yeah, you deal with the these sense, emotions yeah it was more in the sense of uh realizing that later on again hands up males we don't pay attention and we don't think something's wrong so in the beginning originally the first month or couple of months it was the wife's like hey lawrence you, you, you're not all good you, you know, there's, there's something up, you just, and it's like, no, no, I'm fine. I'm just recovering. I'm tired. I'm all of this stuff. And it was, I had to hit that stone wall four or five months later. I had to be head off that horse for my realization 
that the horse I was on was it wasn't a bloody horse. It was some little jackrabbit that I thought was a horse, right? <laughs> and I'm for um, not not just want to say it's a male thing, but it's a society thing. Is we sometimes people only realize once they've fallen off how you know how bad it really was um, to, or to seek the help and ask it. Um, so I was thrown with curveball. I didn't want. I didn't want to accept it. I didn't want to accept that I'd fallen. I didn't want to accept that now nah, this go getter successful person was no longer successful. I didn't want to accept that everything I'd worked for and shown up and gone, hey, look, look how cool that looks. All of that didn't exist anymore. Or, or it wasn't stable. It was all BS and falling apart. Mm. And finally, I had to openly admit and go. Mm. I can't, I, mm. you know, I, I need the help. I can't make it work. This just isn't, and, and I got to that cracking point. Mm. And I wish I didn't got, I wish I didn't get to that point. I wish I didn't get to that point before I said it. I wish it was two months or three months earlier where I went and, and, and was brave enough and stop in, you know, the old caveman mentality and actually speak up and go, hold on, I need help. I need someone to come and, you know, talk to me and figure out what is actually going on. Lawrence, sometimes you have to give yourself also a bit of a break because bottom line is you were a fighter, fight, fight, fight. Yeah. And the harder it gets, the more you fight. That is normal. That is what we yeah. do. That is and that is the, the incredible problem because it has suited us so well. It has created a lot of a lot of who we are. We identify with with what we have created. We we think that is it. Look who I am. Ha ha. And but that is normal. That is we are the bloody fighters. Yeah. Um, and you need to find that low point because otherwise you will not change. You will never admit to that thing. You need to run into that wall. And yeah, why do I know? <laughs> I've kissed many a walls. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's, yeah, we can talk burnout for a long time here. Uh, but no, the reality is you found that dark night of the soul. And I think that is the most beautiful starting point for any transformation, for any change. And I love it how you said you if you need to be willing to look for that little glimmer of light. Yep. Who was that light? Who, who was there a person who came into your life to, to guide you? There was, there was a group of people. Um, so obviously at that moment, um, having that realization there would have been a group of people um sporadic put out the the big the two biggest things i was struggling with that moment was obviously uh, wife family um and wealth now i'm not talking about richness or wealth. i'm talking about actually just being able to pay bills and mm. you know survive month on month so those were the two areas um w w on the wife side of things as soon as I acknowledge and open up. We could sit down and have those conversations and work out the things that relationships sometimes don't do to the, the, the last part. We were able to sit down and go, okay, I still have these problems. Okay, we both admit it. When this happens, this is how we got to react. So one of the most simplest things we did, and we haven't had to do it, oh, geez, in, we haven't had to do it in 2021 at all, is we had to build a safe word. And what the safe word was, because I became really hot-headed when I couldn't understand how my body was reacting, I would instantly lose it. But also, I would push people till they lost it. So what we had done between is one of the conversations with myself and my wife, we'd say, we had a safe word. If any one of us said it to each other, no matter what we were doing, you had to keep quiet and you had to stop whatever was going on about that situation. So we could be having a conversation right now and Stephen, you could feel I was going down the path and you would say the safe word and I would go, okay, fine. And I would, I would walk away or I'd go do something else. And it broke that, um, that chain reaction that was going to start. And as funny and as strange as that seems, there was one of the biggest changes that happened because we didn't get to that fiery part mm. daily. It was happening like every day. Mm. And the realization, once you had a word said to you, you would go, wow, you've said that three times today. You know, wow, you see that five times to me today. So all of a sudden your brain goes, hold on. Now you can actually realize what is happening on the family side of things or on your personal side of things. 
and bring it a bit side on the on the other side on the business side of things i um at that moment um i had to realize i had to change things from a financial point of view a wealth point of view how to how to get ahead and i remembered a couple of years a couple of years a couple of months earlier while i was recovering because i like giving my time away and helping other people um is i went and crewed at an event a, a gary v event um in auckland and I'd met a whole lot of group of people um, through this event, and they were all about wealth creation, and they were talking about better, and all, but everything in case being better of yourself and how to find yourself, what's important, and creating your wealth. Not just in, when I talk about wealth, to me, it's not just about money. It's about embeddement and being empowered in what you do. It's about all of that. And I remembered this group of people there, and I said, okay, maybe they can help me. So I reached out to a handful of them in the beginning part of 2020. And it wasn't that I asked them. I actually begged them and said, I need help. I said, I, I, this is my situation. I have nowhere to see the next steps. And I begged them, you know, to take me on and to guide me and, and help me through the situation. And over the first 30 to 60 to 90 days, we'll be able to make subtle changes in the, in the, in my way I was running my accounts, my bank. So I had sold everything I could sell except for a couple of properties I still owned. I held on to that as dear life because my old man always told me never sell a property if you don't need to. So I held on to that. We were literally a couple of months away from having to sell them because we, we couldn't pay the bills. But what happened is the, they came, the team came in in the beginning and we looked through a lot of how that is working, how my accounts doing, how myself and my wife's accounts doing, how everything was set up. And we made slowly sort of made in subtle changes, started in those slow processes and realized that with the right guidance of those changes, the numbers were changing. All of a sudden, I wasn't paying as much as I thought I was supposed to pay and it was coming less and less. And a month later, I was able to make the payment and I was also forced back to work. So I was working, a little bit of income was coming in slowly those steps were starting to take. Um, but because I was looking at it at worst case, we were making all the drastic cuts we had to cut this off, no takeaways, cut that off, you know, live on the bare bones of what you can to survive till you can see that next line. Mm -hmm. And then you slowly start turning the cog one more and one more and one more till it starts helping improve as, as you go along. That's beautiful. But what you're saying there, let me paraphrase that. You actually came to a, a point where you accepted that you were no longer in power of what was happening and you were mm -hmm. willing to seek help and you believe that there is help out there. Well, that's actually step one, two and three from the AA. OK, yeah. so <laughs> just drawing a parallel here. Hey, yeah. That is actually funny how transformations happen. <laughs> Then the next step is then that you take a brutal inventory of mm -hmm. what is going on. I guess what your team did. That's exactly that. Guys, do you hear that? Can you hear that? What is happening here? So obviously the AA system, even if you did not even think that it's worth even the dimension, mm -hmm. he 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 you saw it in action. And but it was really beautiful that it was not just any odd Tom, Dick and Harry who came to your help, but it was actually, it was people who knew what they were talking about. Yes. And that is really so important. So uh, it, <laughs> you should always sort of talk to a financial advisor and ask, first of all, well, look, here, tell me your portfolio, you know, yeah. and <laughs> see that they actually know what they are talking about. Uh, and here you are, you were lucky to find these people. And I guess the lesson to learn is these people are out there and these mm -hmm. people are often so willing to help you. And that is, that is, that is so crucial because when we're in the darkness, we don't see it. You mm -hmm. think there's no, there's no hope. I'm in such a bad place. There's absolutely no way that I could possibly ever get out of it. And that's the lie that depression and anxiety mm -hmm. and, and PTSD tell you. Addiction tell you, no, look, I'm so bad. And then shame and guilt and all mm -hmm. that shit, for fuck's yeah. sake. Yeah, totally. I mean, look, I had a, the, the, the amazing team that helped me on that side of things. You know, it's a company called Wealth Mentor and Lighthouse Financial that's, that runs, that, that brought me back. Um, I'm, I'm part of one of those companies now, and I try and help people as well because, as you said, that, that they gave me that hand, right? Anyone that's stuck and someone gives you a handout, 
it's so much easier to take that, that step to get out when someone's giving you the hand. And that was a bit of a realization for myself, right? Was that the, the hardest step you ever going to take, the, the hardest moment you're ever going to have to make is that first one. Mm. So to me, that first moment of actually asking for that help and then going, I'm willing to take it was the hardest moment in that journey to mm. get myself back on track. And after that, because I'd gone here, all of a sudden, the problem was a little bit further away from me, behind me. Mm. And then when I did another one, it was even further back behind me. And all of a sudden, that light that I spoke about earlier was just getting a little bit brighter and a little bit brighter. And and through that is how I was able to build it up and, mm. to, and to back the control that mm. I was able to reinvest and follow different strategies that I'm happy to cover off you know, when I had no money, how to get into smaller strategies and build certain things up there, but also gave me a realization that life is fragile. You don't know what tomorrow has. Is the expected, you know, point of your working to your future retirement exactly what you want in your life? That was one of the biggest things that I realized because I was like, at the, before my surgery, I was like, great. You know, I got the properties, you know, I got all that, what I thought my strategy was. I'm building till I'm 55 or 60, whatever my retirement I want to do. I'm going to have a retirement. Uh, it's going to pay out to me at that stage. And at 35, I was hoping I was going to live the next day. And at 65, when everything was going to pay out to me that I expected in my future, it wouldn't have been shit, mm -hmm. you know? And that's the sort of stuff. It was one of the biggest realizations of the of the life and overall creation of what actually do you want in your life? If something tomorrow, I do not wish this on anyone in the world. Mm. Do not get them wrong. But do you have that realization? If you ask yourself tonight, when you even even you listening to this or watching this, if tomorrow everything was taken away from you, what could you do to continue uh, living the life and being the person you are and giving the family and the people around you everything you want? And that was a big thing that's pivoted around my wealth and how I build my wealth now to allow me that I've always got protection tomorrow. Mm. So it gives me protection, not as much in 30 years, but mm. I've got more opportunities mm. if something happens to me tomorrow than I ever mm. had before. And again, you have redefined your why. Mm -hmm. Why do you do things? You didn't just somehow visualize, I oh, would be nice to have a million dollars or whatever the figure you want to put out there. Uh, you didn't look at what anymore. You didn't look, you didn't, you'd completely refocused. Yep. Why do I do what I do? Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, such a powerful change in attitude. When you actually start with that, mm -hmm. why and then how, then there is actually no stopping you. And that can be such a beautiful experience. And here you are, you have lived yep. that. And you were 100,000 in, in red. Now, that's not easy to recoup. Again, it was not that someone just gave you 100,000 or 200,000. No, mm -hmm. they gave you skills. They gave you, they worked with you and, you know, said, okay, now this, this is probably not working so well. What about this one? So mm -hmm. the inventory. And so many people will never, ever do that. They never, ever do that. I mean, budgeting skills, what's that? Do schools even still actually teach that? Uh, I don't think so. My boys didn't learn that. Um, so, you know, simple things like that. So financial literacy is really what you were talking about. That is uh, that is where you're starting off with. And that is such a powerful, powerful thing. And uh, that's wonderful. And you don't, in your case, you had a team to help you. But not everyone has got a team and if you if you're really really struggling etc there you might start smaller you might go to the citizen advice bureau um, or to other places the salvation army um, there are budgeting services out there that can help you and that can help you actually reconsolidate your credit cards so that you're not paying stupid interest fees uh, stuff like that so sometimes when you're so in the dark hole you don't see that you don't see right. that by actually asking for help, suddenly the pain can stop. Mm -hmm. And it's not just, it's not just, sorry that I interrupt your, your, your thought there, but it's not just that pain. It's, it's such a liberation when you actually spell it out and you stop hiding, when you, when you jump over your shadow and you admit 
that you're that it's no longer working and someone actually says that's okay it's we have seen that before let me help you mm -hmm. and this is such a relief you cannot imagine it until you have actually done it uh, it's it's beautiful yeah it is one of, one of the big things I saw through, you know, so that was sort of 2020 and then we had COVID coming across and everyone else. One of the big things that I saw, you know, you're talking about going to Citizens, citizens Advice Bureau and everything else. You'll be surprised at how many companies, if you if you actually ask for help, you know, ask for help for legitimate reasons, mm -hmm. you know, they will help. And how many companies on the other side of the coin, no matter what, won't help you. And it just shows you, I was quite surprised through that and through a lot of people since me going through that mm -hmm. and helping and talking to other people and show them how, how many people will be in your corner if you mm -hmm. ask and you're willing to go there and how many companies that they thought were great, amazing uh, New Zealand companies with big power behind them and everything else did not care a hoot who they were or what okay. they were, right? Okay. And that's something one of the biggest realizations was in the sense of, Sometimes it's the loyalty to what you think is important that you brought up with and they will look after you is not really the way. And it's uh, it's the smaller businesses out there that might be, you might have thought of a bit more peculiar and they will help you. All the help that I received in the beginning cost me nothing. All the help that cost, it didn't cost me a single cent in the first couple of months to get my life semi back on track. After that, in the bigger decisions and the other things I did, obviously, is the, you know, as I got back and uh, created wealth and that sort of stuff, that's a bit of a difference. But the, the, to get me back onto that train track, that cost me absolutely nothing. It's just because I was lucky enough and brave enough that I asked for help. And they were like, yep, come on board. We'll help you and we'll get you back onto place. And those are, this is why one of the biggest things is saying these were the, this, these two, the, the two big companies I'm talking about, Lighthouse Financial and Wealth Mentor. I always swear to, to the grave and I support them, always have mm. every single day because that is what they did to me. Um, they, they brought me back fundamentally, not from, you know, almost brought me back from, from the death of my career and my path and my wealth. And there's no one else that would have done that but them. Yes, so true. And you speak about this openness to to accept and the willingness to, to accept help. Um, this is beautiful. And having said that, uh, sometimes it can be very hard for people to actually find that help. So mm -hmm. I think you need to start somewhere. And I think one of the things, one of the places you can start is actually with your GP. Is actually with with the people who normally look after you, and that's what your GP is there for. And maybe just say, "Hey, look, I'm, I'm, we are really hitting hard times, and there might be uh, good reasons that or good things that he can do from his point of view." Yeah. But you might be amazed how many stories he has heard and what he knows of support networks that are out there to be of assistance to you wherever you are. That might be in the help with a psychologist. That might be in the help with actually a um, a life coach who knows very well how to help you because he or she might have been in, in a very similar story or a similar situation. So there's so much. So again, I want to reiterate, if you feel that you're in trouble, mm -hmm. go to your GP. Just be open, be honest. Make it make a, a double appointment. Don't just go there for fifteen minutes. And obviously now level four, forget that. I mean, it's it's not not so easy. But mm -hmm. at some stage we will come out. There's also Zoom and and telephone calls, etc. So get that ball rolling. Get that ball rolling and talk to someone and see where this person can help you. And then maybe the door opens to another person, then to another person. So the hope is absolutely there the help is there please believe me believe me and believe lawrence you know he has gone through the shit and wealth mentors is is definitely a good company i mean we we are uh, equally that's that's how we two got together uh my wife is is part of wealth mentors, uh, wealth mentors as well so yes great education great teaching great everything so no two ways around it you have found your feet again, and now you're helping others. 
Mm-hmm. And but throughout the whole time, you you had a, a podcast going um, where you wanted to learn and where you wanted to go. So you've you've always been a man who has had several things going. So where is that new Lawrence going now? What is that? Where is the, the where is the drive leading you now? Because as we all once we have started transforming. Mm-hmm. We, have, we, we get addicted to it. We get addicted to becoming better and, and redefining ourselves and becoming better human beings. It's a beautiful journey. So where are you going? So obviously, you know, through uh, as true, uh, there's been quite a, quite a not a large, but a, a gradual pivot um, through my brand and my direction since that situation. So uh, my brand has now gone from being this big, the best in the business and the, the, the woos of woos and the success to what is, what is stuff people actually need to know and what people need to learn about. So my, the Wolf of Queen Street has become very specific now, sort of 70% of it is around property and business, specifically in New Zealand and Australian space. Um, and it's about educating um, the audience out there, the things they need to learn and pick up. Um, one of the things I'm big and I'm, I'm proud about my brand is I'll go and recommend or I'll get the I'll get the people on the show that will talk about how to start up a company or how to invest in property or how to invest in something else or so forth. But there would no there will never be any expectations. And I'll always call this out because I'm happy to challenge any of the brands that want to tell me otherwise. Is I don't sell. I don't make a hook. I don't get any kickback on anything that I recommend and, and do out there from the education. And I think, unfortunately, we live in a society at the moment where everyone goes, hey, I'll give you a little bit, but then, therefore, I want something back from you. And that is one of the biggest things I, I, I saw in uh, we're going through that situation is we have a society that is, is lacking in the education we need. We talk about financial education and financial investing. We, talk, we can talk about properties. You know, it's massive in New Zealand. You sit on the one side or the other side, whether you like or you don't like it because you don't have the opportunities. But one of the biggest things is whether you have it or you don't have it, the education around it does not exist. And the people providing the education in most instances – don't do it freely because they want to. They're doing it because there's a business model behind it. So a lot of what I'm doing now is going out in the best way I can and um, through my show, getting uh, getting people on to speak and give that education so people can come across and find out that things they need and not expect someone to go at the back going, oh, I told you the first step, uh, the second step, you've got to pay me for it. <laughs> there's, there's, there's none of that. And, and that's yeah. the sort of stuff. So I can give back as much as possible. And that's mm-hmm. where my brain's got into today. Nice. That's beautiful. So tell us the name of your brand. Tell us how people can find you. And that is really well, the important bit. Well, obviously the podcast is called The Wolf of Queen Street, um, but my brand is just my name, Lawrence Lotz. You can find me on every social platform uh, that exists, even on TikTok, um, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, um, and so forth out there is where you can search and you'll find me. And um, I'm most active on majority of them. Um, mm-hmm. I don't, uh, I enjoy my social media life. So by all means, you can just reach out to me on any one of those handles and uh, mm-hmm. you'll find me there. Mm-hmm. And it's so beautiful. It is, it is such a beautiful journey to discover, especially when you are not used to money and financial knowledge. And it is, uh, it is so riveting. It is a uh, riveting is the wrong word. It's, it's, when you suddenly realize, huh, this this little little piece of knowledge where you suddenly say, wow, okay, and you make a little change based upon that little new bit of knowledge, and you suddenly save hundred dollars a year, thousand dollars a year, or you you make thousand dollars extra income or something like that, or just that you know, wow, if one day I want to buy a property for investment. Now I know how to go about it. Or someone who would have never, ever thought of founding a company um, to actually say, huh, that's really not so difficult. And these are the advantages. But that's all education. That's all teaching. Yep. And it's all basically little steps to actually to, to, to get you that little bit further. And then suddenly, by the time you look around and think, wow, have I come this far? And that's so beautiful. So therefore, the financial education is gorgeous. And in the in pre-recording, I discussed that I come from quite humble and poor circumstances. Mm-hmm. So uh, therefore, 
that I got I got told that money is bad. Uh, money and wealth is bad, and and anyone who has got a nice house, look how they live. And, but it was always a negative kind of thing. And so there are belief systems there in you that might hold you back, that might actually be there. But the only way that how you can deal with such belief systems is that you start learning, and that you actually accept them for what they are. Because they were belief systems that maybe your parents or other people that were influential in your in your childhood and your youth have have implanted because that's the best they knew. That was all they knew, how they felt, how they were uh, brought up. It is what it is. But the past does not be equal to the future. So it, here you are. You you are free to spent those how many how many seconds in a day 18,800 or so <laughs> is is all the same time we have got some of us just choose to spend it more mindfully and and some so to to say well actually today is a really sad day because i haven't learned something new you know why not have that attitude and why not apply that to your relationship with your wife learn something about your wife I tell you, it, that will have remarkable flow-on effects. You will yeah. hopefully like them. Um, or learn something about your finances. Either or, it's a win-win, okay? So, no, beautiful. It's so beautiful, to, And it's amazing to hear your story. But, yeah, your story is ingrained in, in – your story has come true because you always – thought yes i can do that even if it was hard you you thought yes i can ask for help you are a man who takes action little steps sometimes big steps sometimes little steps but you always take action you don't just sit there and wait for something to happen and i think that's the important bit and guys that's what i want you to do and so therefore if lawrence if his is what he is saying rings a bell with you please look down there in the description of the youtube video uh, and of the podcast because his links are there so you can just tap into his podcast and actually listen and sort of get more feeling and maybe work with him more closely how cool would that be and what could you possibly miss out on if you if you do that or what could you do wrong if you do that no, I, I can't hear it either. No, nope. so you might as you might as well. <laughs> so, Lawrence, that was a really, really good good discussion, and it is. We were essentially talking about taboo, which I love to do in my show because money to talk productively about money and wealth is often considered a taboo, and we don't talk about income, etc. And so maybe we should. And maybe we should teach our children um, that this is actually normal and that this is what we should do. Because once you bring it out into the open, uh, credit card debt or bad spending habits or um, procrastination, all these kind of things that can seriously sabotage you. Once you actually bring them out into the open, you can deal with them. Once you keep hiding them, you've got no chance. No. So true. So true, Stefan. <laughs> Lawrence, any parting words? What would you, yeah, out of interest, if you could go back in a time machine and send a message back to your younger self, to the guy in the in the white suit, what oh. <laughs> what would you send back? If if I could send one thing back, it'll be a book, oh. right? Okay, here we go. So I, if I could send one thing back to my 16, 18, 21, even 25 years, I'll be one book. Yeah. And it's a book that I followed and I still and I still do it today. Don't get me wrong, there's a million other ones, but this is the one that I read and made a massive difference around my financial wealth and understanding of it. Not, it didn't make me rich, don't get me wrong. It gave me the education that I've been lacking and never understood. And the education of proper um, wealth, not... Bitcoin and mm -hmm. NFTs and all this other mm -hmm. talking about the, the the wealth that the people that have made a billion dollars and and all their sort of stuff. And it's a book called Money Master the Game by Tony Robbins. Now, if I did send it back 20 years, it would be a problem because it was only written about 10 years ago. So um, <laughs> I would have to be able to send it back in time and still make sure it existed because Tony wouldn't even written yet. But yeah, to me, um, in, in the sense of... Um, 
that part of the creation of myself, that was one of the biggest educational points. Uh, because it's about 10 years old or, old or so, you can buy it for like less than $20 brand new. Mm -hmm. I think you can get it on Trade Me for even less than that. Mm -hmm. Yes, unfortunately, it's about 600 pages. There's a revised version, but don't get that. Get the 600 page version. And it's an amazing education to go through and understanding. And it shows you the one of the most simple things that showed there, one of the crazies you spoke about earlier about having an education point when you when you realize of how much different it is. And it shows you that if you took $1 and you compounded it 100%, which which doesn't exist, but mm. if you took $1 and you compounded it 100% for 20 years, it would be a million dollars, mm. right? Okay, and you go, wow. Okay, how do I do But then in the second question, if that was taxed, it would only be worth something like twenty or $30,000. So there's two questions that come out of that. Firstly, A, how do I compound a dollar each year for 20 years to give me a million dollars? So then you seek that education. And then secondly, that whole big question, how do I make sure I don't pay all that tax so my million dollars becomes $30,000? And I'll leave that there for, for the watchers and the listeners at the moment. So hmm. they can go read up and they can hit me up and tell me what their ideas are of how you can achieve that. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. Lawrence, thank you so much for spending the time with me and my guests here and my, my viewers here. Um, it was a very, very thought provoking and an interesting uh, thing. And I'm, I'm so grateful, honestly. So thank you so much. And you guys out there, look after yourself and make the most out of this beautiful life that you have got. You don't know what tomorrow brings. So you might as well live the moment. But think where yeah who do you want to be when you grow up okay and it doesn't matter if you're 17 or 70 who do you want to be and you know figure that out and then take little steps and get yourself in the right direction and let me guess a wealth of connection a wealth of love a wealth of self-love and a true wealth in a financial sense they all go hand in hand so you might as well work on those pillars of your your life and spread it evenly, not just the not just down one road. Okay, you have to have this balance with it. So, Lawrence, thank you so much, and you guys out there, bye. Dreamer.